Well, my, my clock has, we're on the hour, so I think we will go ahead and get started with today's presentation. We would like to welcome you to the latest presentation in the National Telehealth Resource Center's webinar series. These webinars are designed to provide timely information and demonstration to support and guide the development of your telehealth programs. These webinars are presented on the third Thursday of each month. Located throughout the country, there are 12 regional telehealth resource centers and two national telehealth resource centers. Each serves as a focal point for advancing the effective use of telehealth and supporting access to telehealth services in rural and underserved communities. So a few tips before we get started. Your audio has been muted. Please use the Q&A function of the Zoom platform to ask questions. Uh, Wes is planning on responding to your questions just in time as he's doing the presentation. So if you have a question about what he's talking about, just please go ahead and submit your question at that time. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will be able to access today's and past webinars on the National TRC YouTube channel. So. Today's webinar is hosted by TTAC, which is one of the two national talent health resource centers. And it is my privilege to introduce to you Wesley Valdez, who is a physician who is a wound care specialist, who is working with TTAC to provide clinical perspectives to our telehealth toolkits. And so today, Wes is going to be our presenter. So welcome, Wes, and thank you. Hello, let's see if I can get my screen share to work and we'll get doing there well, or not. Let's see, should be working now. Um, so welcome again, my name is Wesley Valdez. I'm a physician at, um, uh, I'm currently working part-time at UC Davis Health in Sacramento, California and uh, doing telehealth strategy and digital health strategy there. And also as uh, Doris mentioned, working with TTAC on some new toolkits and trying to uh, update the information so it's very useful to our, um, the, uh, the audience and people who are looking for that type of information. Uh, this particular um, uh, webinar will be about video platforms, services, and clinical use. And uh, like she said, please go ahead and ask your questions as, um, as you see fit. Uh, during the show, I really want to talk about things that you are all interested in uh, rather than just sitting up here and going on and on and on about things that I'm interested in. So really consider this a, a, a bit of a two-way conversation um, and uh, in the process. So <clears throat> one of the things that I uh, also would like to bring to your attention, um, we do have, this is a demonstration site. You can't access this right now, but this is just kind of a screenshot example of the uh, video toolkit uh, that we're putting together that will be posted on their new website uh, as that comes up. Um, let's see, I should be sharing that actual demonstration site now. So you can see what we've done is we've, we've taken the uh, pretty much the same content I'm gonna be uh, talking about today and we've moved that into little uh, kind of snippets these are really designed so you can watch them in you know short bursts. We've tried to keep them to you know around seven, eight minutes. I think one of them is about eleven minutes, and some most of them are all shorter than that. But the idea is that you can kind of grab a topic, listen to it uh, without having to sit through a linear one-hour kind of uh, a video. And then uh, when you don't have time or can't, you're in a situation where you can't see the videos. Certainly, we have the uh, ability to. You can just read the content on the site as well in the videos. However, we end up doing it on the new website will uh, be there as well. Uh, we also have a toolkit coming out on the e-stethoscope, uh, which is trying to uh, work hard to uh, create a way where you can uh, actually listen to the sounds of the stethoscope and using some of the new uh, browser technologies, and maybe that'll be something we can cover in a, uh, a later uh, webinar or something else. But so in the new toolkits that are coming, we're really trying to uh, style these to have a lot of uh, more focus on clinical content and um, for practitioners, trying to really get into some use cases and some of those nuances that uh, are important 
when you're trying to uh, you know, figure out how to use this type of information in your clinical setting or your practice. Um, so one of the things that we like to talk about is you know, what's kind of changed. A lot of people, you know, busy clinicians don't have time to really keep up on all this stuff. And frankly, that's one of the things that the TRCs are uh, helping folks out with. So, but if you've kind of been paying attention to telehealth for the last 20 plus years, uh, the way we used to do things was all this really big equipment uh, in the closet, uh, a lot of networking cables and moving large carts around and big boxes and stuff like that. Well, most of that stuff has really graduated to the cloud, kind of like everything else in um, technology is moving onto the cloud, so it's easy to access. And this has just in accelerated the adoption of tel telemedicine in a couple of ways. It's made it so much easier to adopt and to use, uh, particularly for small practices and individual clinicians. And it's also made it uh, very high quality on whatever device, even your phones, um, that you're working with and stuff like that. So you, you used to have to have very expensive equipment on both ends of the equation, so the provider and where the patient is. And these days, as you've seen, as you, you've probably seen with many of these services being marketed today, uh, they can go right to individuals' mobile phones. Uh, and and you know, that was just not something possible to do reliably um, back you know, in the days where we all had our big boxes and things like that stuffed in the closet. So that's one nice uh, uh, aspect of how things have changed. And the other is, um, you know, like I mentioned, from these big uh, bulky carts that I certainly remember pushing down halls from one clinic room to the next uh, to, you know, basically the palm of your hand. Uh, the, the mobile phones have gotten so much powerful, more powerful these days. The screen resolutions on the phones are perfectly adequate for what we're trying to do. But more importantly, since about 2012, 2013, the color accuracy of the mobile device um, uh, screens has improved dramatically. So as it was mentioned, I do wound care and tissue repair, and there was always a concern about how well the screen or the camera was rendering the color red. And that was something we kind of really struggled with is, you know, it's kind of an important color for us, uh, you know, trying to figure out if something's inflamed or infected or something like that. And systems back then would either overstate the red or understate the red. Well, these days the cameras have improved um, on these devices and the, the color accuracy of the screen is improved where that's really not a concern of mine as much anymore. Certainly you do want to advocate that your, um, your clients uh, try to find good lighting sources. Uh, sunlight is obviously the best, um, but where that's not an option, you, too, you, do, you can recommend full spectrum lighting options. And these are really inexpensive bulbs that pe people can uh, exchange in their exam rooms. And most exam rooms are probably leaning towards uh, a fairly high color accuracy uh, light bulbs and stuff like that. So all those things together have just really made uh, the delivery of telemedicine uh, much more friendly um, and less expensive. You know, again, video conferencing solutions were kind of relegated to very large corporations, very large corporate investments. And these days, uh, I mean, with some of the cloud offerings, you can literally sign up uh, in a day and have your um, basic system up and running, at least for video conferencing, um, and pay a monthly, you know, stipend to access very, very uh, high quality services. Um, Today, I am actually in my office at UC Davis, which is why I just have a wall right now because I haven't set up a studio here. But this image that you're looking at is kind of, this is my studio um, where one of the things that I've been exploring is how to really improve the uh, experience of the customer when talking to a provider on telemedicine. So one of the things we, you know, again, you get back to the lighting, you want to have the light in front of you, not a big window behind you and all these kinds of things. This particular image, this is not my office. I wish it was my office. My, one, my office isn't that clean and it's not that big. Um, but the, uh, this is really just a green screen. So um, that sounds expensive, but it's kind of a $20 piece of paper. Uh, that's the color green and a couple shop lights from Home Depot and some software. It, I'm able to create this kind of an environment uh, customer experience when I'm talking on video uh, normally. So this, uh, the uh, T-TAC toolkits 
were shot in this studio using this technology, this equipment. And it takes a little bit of work, but, and this is probably more than your typical provider would want to go through in their office. But even the situation I'm in right now, what I've done is um, I've taken the, um, the camera and the computer in this office and I've just turned them to, towards a blank wall. And I have the, uh, the light from the window coming at me. So hopefully I'm well lit from the front, uh, not kind of the silhouette thing and stuff like that. I am uh, probably a little bit closer than usual. Normally I would stand behind. I would try to have my hands in uh, the, uh, the field of view, uh, as it, you can see in the picture. And that just comes from news organizations, organizations and photography uh, uh, principles that it's helpful to build trust in a virtual environment if people can see your hands and they kind of see what you're working on and not working on. So if I would switch back to, let me stop the screen share for just a second and come back to um, me, um, let's see. So right now I'm just basically, I turn the camera towards a blank wall using, you know, just general front lighting to, uh, to see me, trying to look at the camera when I talk, uh, far enough away from the camera that I, you can see my hands. Um, I'm standing, uh, have my information below about who I am and, Give some identity and things like that. So just some general principles about how to provide a good customer experience. Uh, we go into this a lot more detail in the toolkit. Um, there's a video on it uh, that kind of talks about it as well. And if anybody really wants the green screen uh, uh, setup recording, we could probably put one of those together as well. Um, so again, just a, an example of just some kind of basic things that a lot of time times we don't think about uh, to provide a good video experience. So the one thing I, I do want to talk about that, you know, it's, it's kind of, you have a talk about video and telehealth uh, webinar, and it's really easy to go over the stuff that we've learned and we've talked about for 20 years, namely how can you have a provider, you know, can you have a provider talk to a patient on video? And I think we're, we're at least far enough along that one of the things I'd like people to start thinking about is, also, how can they use the video for other types of services in the office? And many times I'll, I'll uh, encounter an office where the provider isn't quite ready for telehealth. They're trying to make that decision about whether they can fit it into their workflow or how would they get paid. And a lot of these kind of questions come up. And I encourage uh, people in those situations to go ahead and um, <clears throat> purchase the equipment uh, to communicate on video with your clients. Um, for a couple reasons. One, the equipment is really inexpensive. Um, even for what I'm doing right now, uh, I'm using a, a off-the-shelf webcam from a big box store. Um, the one I'm using is a Logitech C920, uh, C uh, but you know, there's ones for $35 that frankly would do an excellent job of uh, capturing the appropriate video, video for the provider side of the equation. But think about the other aspects of your office workflow that patients would appreciate or enjoy talking to a human about. So, you know, the things I have listed on the slide here, uh, front desk services, you know, registration, um, getting forms signed and, and messages. Many of the toolkits and uh, solutions on the market today include, they certainly have video capabilities, but they also have uh, screen sharing. We're doing that right now. And some of those screen sharing solutions um, have, you can post, um, show patients the form that you want them to fill out. Or you can um, you know, show them your compliance or whatever your documentation is. And you can get these things filled out online with the patient. Uh, I've even seen people say, okay, well, we need to know your medications. And sometimes the patients won't know their medications or they know it's the pink pill or the blue pill. And they'll just say, okay, let's just go into your bathroom and show me, I'll take a picture of your medicine cabinet. And the resolution of the camera, uh, of the video is high enough today that you can read the, um, the labels on these medication bottles. And it's a real great way to see into your patient's life and uh, you know, what they're allowing you to see to help understand, wow, you have a whole lot of medication up there. Maybe let's you know, look at some maybe you don't need and help get that information in an online process, as opposed to waiting that for them to come to the office for those kinds of things. So there's many ways to use uh, video technology 
in the clinical workflow, or at least I would say the care of the patient, that uh, are basically still the same process as telehealth, but it's not necessarily the patient city, uh, talking to a provider trying to solve or diagnose a particular healthcare issue. There's lots of other things to think about if your office is still coming to kind of grips or trying to figure out how to use video. They're not ready for the provider to sit in front of a patient and they're still trying to figure out some of those things. There's other things that uh, you can offer to your patients uh, to leverage a video uh, kind of service for. Uh, you certainly see the nursing support and questions and interactions. Um, again, I do wound care, so patients will go home with a set of dressing instructions, and invariably, a lot of times, they kind of have questions about, well, okay, did this go first, or did I do that first? And in the past, having to answer those questions using you know, just a phone call, which we would get a lot of, having the patient be able to... Uh, explain or show what they're doing um, through video is certainly helpful. That visual component, at least for addressing change process, uh, really helps kind of understand what the patient's trying to do or trying to accomplish or where they're confused. Um, and frankly, I also ask them to use their video um, in the office. So if they're in the office and I'm explaining how to do addressing or put something on, as, you know, addressing that requires several steps, oftentimes I'll just ask them, do you have a phone? If most of them do these days, all right, whip that baby out and record what I'm doing. And I'll just let them record on their own phone uh, the dressing process so they can take that home with them and play it back. Again, it's, it's kind of outside the box of the traditional telehealth, here's how you use video conversation. But it's still video. You're still using a video camera. And it's just another use case that it kind of eases the adoption and increases the the utilization of any investment in this type of uh, infrastructure or recognizing when other people are frankly walking around with very high quality cameras and video equipment in their pocket that we often don't think of. And another service line is billing and revenue services. Again, talking to your patients and helping understand their, their billing process or uh, you know, revenue or there's an issue or a question. This is more to do with the forms piece and sometimes you just need a signature or you, uh, they needed to get something signed to move to the next uh, step of the process. The, we, we often think, again, of video as talking heads, or I'm gonna show you a body part, or I'm gonna show you the inside of an ear. Well, a video of your screen or a video of your form uh, is, again, it's another way to utilize the, ask the, the technology of video and streaming uh, to you know, move the care process along. It's just a video of a form that's being filled out or electronically signed. And again, there are solutions on the market that allow that to be done in this type of an environment. Um, for example, one of the things that I have on my website, and I can kind of show you this live, um, is I, I've been using the proactive chat. Uh, so this proactive chat that I have um, does <coughs> support the use of video. Um, but again, it's directly from my website. And it's just another way to engage the patient in a process. So, and please, everybody, don't go to my website and try to talk to me right now because <coughs> that would be a little challenging. Um, but it'll pop up, and you could just ask a question. And right here, you, there, you, they can basically start talking to me through the website. If they would click this, they could start a video through my website. And this is all running on uh, WebRTC technology. Uh, on the back end, it's encrypted, it's secure, um, although I don't particularly tr try to use this too much for uh, PHI. But it is a way for patients to initiate a video conversation. Again, m mostly showing the point that the, the cost of this is, I mean, this particular solution costs maybe $20 uh, a month, and it's pretty inexpensive. Uh, and so there's just a lot of those out there that are really easy um, to integrate uh, into your process. And the nice thing about some, some of the newer ones is you can actually transfer the video call or transfer the audio call uh, within the software. So some of the video uh, conferencing uh, technologies, it's kind of either this type of a situation, one to many, or one to one, or one to two, um, or you know, multi-party calls. Some of the newer ones that you see on the market will have the ability to have the video request like from a website 
answered by a receptionist uh, or a front desk person in that ca in this case, and then um, transferred to a nurse, and then you can transfer that conversation to a nurse practitioner or a physician or a podiatrist or whoever in your system that co conversation needs to be transferred to. So kind of having that call center type of utilization, and that can all be done while the video is active and running, which I think gives a, a really unique and um, uh, wonderful customer experience uh, when a patient's trying to communicate with a healthcare office or system with a problem that they're having. Remember that, you know, the re whole, one of the main, main reasons we enjoy video so much is because, uh, you know, people have claimed that 70% of uh, communication is nonverbal. And when a patient's calling with a question, uh, I've often been able to tell that they are a little confused or they're not quite getting what I'm saying um, just by the look. Whereas, you know, when it was on the phone or something like that, I just absolutely missed that. And we just keep going on about how to, uh, you know, solve the problem or change the dressing or something like that. Kind of like in this situation where I can't see all of you out there, uh, you know, for all I know, people are falling asleep or they're confused or they don't know exactly what I'm saying. Uh, ideally, if we had that two-way, uh, you know, ability, I would be able to react on your body position and your facial uh, um, gestures and things like that to kind of nuance or direct the conversation. Um, so going back to the slides, hope that worked. Um, the other thing that uh, I'm using, we found it, uh, a fun little thing to do is uh, leaving video messages. So again, if you go to my website, this is something that uh, I have been using about letting people leave a video message. So we're all comfortable with the answering machine uh, where a patient or a person can call my office and leave a voicemail. Um, and again, you know, in wound care, they're trying to describe the problem that they're having or they have this concern about their wound or something. Well, with traditional video conferencing, someone has to be on the other end to answer that call. So if you wanted to do a video conference with the office, if the office is closed or it's after hours or something, you know, someone needed to be there to answer that um, phone. Just like in a telephone, if you wanted to have the conversation, someone needed to answer the phone. Well, that's why we all came up with answering machines for telephones. But this is kind of a new uh, use case of basically it's an answering machine for video calls. Because again, for wound care, if someone has a question about their wound, it's nice for them to send me a video uh, message um, of them changing their dressing or what their wound currently looks like or they can point to where the problem is. And just like as an answering machine would work, it'll package that video up um, and it'll alert me that there is a new uh, message on the video answering machine. And I can go watch that video uh, kind of later uh, and kind of get a really good piece of information and comfort level about what is going on. Now, this particular one is HIPAA compliant. It's all in secure, uh, encrypted, at rest, all that stuff. So you definitely want to make sure that you're still covering all your regulatory needs and things like that. But again, it's, it's a, a use case that I'm seeing adopted more in just in industries all over the place, uh, leveraging the asynchronous process of communication uh, as opposed to always having to have a live conversation. So this is just a use case in, um, in healthcare of the, you know, similarly to texting where someone will ask a question, I might get back to you maybe 20 minutes later, which in healthcare starts to align a lot better with practitioners because obviously if we're in a room with a patient or we're tied up in a surgery or a procedure or something like that, we can't always be available to take a call, or even our office is busy and can't take a call. Whereas being able to leverage the ability to leave a message still lets the patient get their information to us, and we take that information when we get a chance to. So just another uh, little way to um, use a video technology to help uh, in the patient care process. So again, uh, if there's any questions or people would like a little more detail on uh, one topic or another, or you just have a random question that you don't think I'm going to cover, by all means, uh, post up a question and we'll try to get to it. Uh, so I did want to go back to the slides and talk about bringing in your screen. So 
just like I've been kind of jumping back and forth between a PowerPoint slide deck um, where we, this is just screen sharing, to where you see me screen share the, uh, um, a browser page and show you an actual live website. Um, in those environments, you can play videos, you can go over educational content, you can um, show parts of the patient's chart, assuming it's that patient and obviously you know, following all the rules and regulations and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, for example, if you're trying to uh, explain to a patient that they need to purchase a particular deodorant that doesn't have metal shavings uh, for patients on chemo or something like that, you can certainly bring those, uh, that list up online <clears throat> and show that to the patient in a screen sharing or uh, screen video sharing kind of a situation, as opposed to just trying to tell the patient to put things in a browser and stuff like that. You can kind of do it for them and show them what you're doing. Uh, some uh, <clears throat> platforms on the market actually let both people interact with that website. You can actually push a website to a patient's browser on their side. And then as the patient's scrolling or trying to order uh, some equipment or um, something like that, the physician's office can actually see what's going on and help the patient al along that process, either doing annotations on the patient's side to kind of point to where to click things and stuff like that. And it's just a way to make that whole process easier uh, for a consumer, particularly a consumer that might be ill or just not feeling very well and not wanting to navigate uh, the complexities that healthcare so often uh, presents to them. But certainly sharing lab results and uh, radiology images and other things like that are other things that you can do now through this uh, process of screen sharing and co-browsing which again, we're doing right now. Uh, I'm just showing you a PowerPoint screen. I could have just as easily, uh, as you see before, show you a browser or pull up a radiology image on my computer and share that with the audience as well. Um, and again, some of these have the ability to also capture signatures. So if your patients are on a mobile device um, or a laptop with a touch screen, you can even capture digital electronic signatures in this process as well which can be very useful when onboarding a patient or trying to make sure that patient's uh, documents are appropriately signed, making that process a little bit easier once they show up to the office and, and doing it ahead of time. So lots of ways to uh, leverage the ability to bring in a screen and um, try to make that experience better for the patient. Um, again, educating your patients, uh, you know, certainly when you have them in the office, we already spend a lot of time with our patients educating them on how to use technology. Certainly anybody that has had to onboard a patient with a glucose meter or some piece of technology that you kind of need to get them to use correctly. Well, you know, the cameras and their phones are wonderful pieces of equipment that a little time in the office showing them how to do this properly or do it well can make your lives a lot easier if you intend on letting them connect to you once they go home to try to show you things as well. So as an example, if uh, you, know, you can get too close to what you're trying to take a picture of and patients often try to put the phone or something in the camera you know, as close as they can, <clears throat> not understanding that that image to the practitioner on the other side may become useless if it's too close. And even holding your, your, uh, the situation or your skin or the wound or whatever it is they're trying to show far away, <clears throat> um, the resolution is so high these days that you can zoom that up on the practitioner side. So helping your patients you know, or even allowing your patients to do this in the office, setting up a connection in the office uh, you know, from their phone or from their device right to the computer in the office can show them, hey, you, know, you can hold it about a foot away and that's probably fine for most of these. And um, you know, have good light. Uh, I typically recommend patients going to their closet or their kitchen or their bathroom, which usually they have been installed uh, lights with a better color color accuracy. Bathrooms are usually pretty good for this. Uh, try to limit the motion, understanding the limitations of the focus. iPhones are usually about 70 centimeters, six to eight inches um, uh, away. Will get you a, a wonderful image. But also understanding that you know, if you get too close, sometimes it's difficult for the providers to even know what part of the body that is. So especially if you're able to, uh, they're able to send video in, you know, they can start from far away and then zoom in closer, like you kind of saw in the video here of the hand, 
uh, if they're really trying to focus on something specific, as opposed to sending an individual picture, which sometimes can be confusing. Also, when they get to send video, they get to add sound and they get to talk about, uh, you know, kind of remind you their name and what the situation is and any concerns and things like that. So that was the part in the color and the identification is we just want to make sure we know what part of the body we're looking at. Now some future kind of far out things um, to talk about video is, uh, this is just an example of Ellurian video magnification. Again, a lot of times we think of the, the webcam as a way to reproduce the talking head experience of the healthcare encounter. Well, it turns out that these little cameras, these little webcams are actually pretty powerful things that capture a lot more data than our eyes are able to appreciate. So this is just an example of a, um, a way that a, a webcam watching an individual can tell the heart rate of the individual by the very small fluctuations of the color uh, red or the, the colors in the skin. Now, we can't really appreciate that with our eyes, and the magnification part of this is they've really ex, um, magnified the, the variance of the color red. It, it doesn't change this much, but they, they magnify the color red so we can appreciate what the camera is seeing, although what the camera is seeing is, is much more subtle. But you can imagine that um, while a, a webcam is pointed at a patient, Yes, it's wonderful for recreating the talking head experience, but through solutions like these, um, we can also uh, capture their heart rate, capture their respiratory rate. Uh, we can capture the color of the sclera of the eye, see is there any jaundice there. Um, you know, there's just, we're learning many, many more things that the video is capturing that we just haven't been able to tease out of that data that now with these new algorithms and artificial intelligence processes that we're passing over the video at the same time as it's coming through, we can learn a lot more about the situation on the other end. You know, particularly uh, clinically, obviously, we're looking for how to get vital signs from a patient or these types of pieces of information. So that's been kind of a, a really exciting area that I think we're gonna see uh, grow a lot in the future where we learn um, more and more about what video can do. I think it will help justify the uh, rationale of leveraging video in places where normally we've been okay with a picture. I mean, for years in wound care, it was, okay, send me a picture of your wound, uh, or we would take a picture of the wound, and we've been doing that. And we used to do it on Polaroid grid film <clears throat> with a little Polaroid camera and put that into the chart. So. We've been using pictures for a long time. We've all gotten very used to that. But as we talk about, well, you can leverage video. A big question is going to come up. It's like, well, okay, I know I could do this by video, but why would I want to go through the expense or the trouble or look at this new way of doing it? Doing it how I've been doing it seems to have worked pretty well. And that's kind of the same conversation that we have about, well, why don't I just do it over the telephone? That's worked for you know, 20, 30 years for me. Um, <clears throat> I don't really need to do like video conferencing. And like everything in medicine, you don't need to do uh, uh, you know, the high-end, super complicated thing for everything. But I do think it's a nice uh, tool for us to be aware of. Uh, also, be very aware of the limitations of that tool uh, from a clinical uh, side of the equation. And sometimes, you know, still, I still talk to patients on the phone. I don't force everybody to come on video. And when that's appropriate, that's perfectly fine. Secure texting, frankly, can solve a lot of my problems and a lot of my patients' problems. Uh, and, you know, that works too. So I think, again, it's nice to have uh, systems where you can do all of that. For example, the, the one that I displayed on my website, you can text, you can do audio, you can do video. And the nice thing about that is it keeps it all in one stream of a persistent uh, conversation. Whereas you text when you need it, you use the audio when that's the best way, and you use video when that's the best way. So again, from a clinical standpoint, you use the tool that is best to achieve the purpose that you need to achieve at that given time, and if it's available. Sometimes it's text, sometimes it's video. 
But I think as we learn more about the power of what video can assist us with as clinicians, you know, certainly being able to uh, have a camera while a cam I'm talking to a patient to see if their heart rate goes up uh, just by the information that the camera is already capturing, uh, it certainly opens up some clinical doors to me. Uh, you know, whether that's just the patient's getting anxious about what I'm telling them, or maybe that might translate into some uh, ability to understand how much pain they're in. But certainly, you know, heart, knowing heart rate has, and some of these other vital signs has been a bit of a challenge for the direct to consumer uh, side of the uh, telehealth equation is, well, how do we get this information from patients who don't have all the tools and toys that we would have in a clinical setting? Well, we're finding out that video, uh, even these little web cameras that you can buy at a big box store, are collecting enough information over time that these pieces of information can be teased out accurately and reliably uh, without having the traditional tools um, you know, that we normally uh, would go to in a clinical setting. I think another use of video, and I didn't ha have a chance to uh, uh, get this slide created, but the augmented reality and the virtual reality aspects of leveraging video. This is a bit more of a streaming uh, uh, use case. It's not necessarily two-way, although I, there are certainly those use cases coming out. But for pain management and pain control uh, in physical therapy, we're having those conversations here about how to leverage that type of information, those video uh, scenarios and settings where the patient is wearing uh, their augmented reality headset or their virtual reality headset and you can put them in a world and you can ask them to do things. Um, it could be as simple as doing you know, virtual rings for hand therapy or arm therapy or something at home where the physical therapist is you know, talking to them in a two-way video scenario but controlling this augmented uh, reality world or virtual reality world that the patient sees are finding wonderful successes with that type of uh, structure for decreasing the, uh, the pain um, or increasing the pain threshold or decreasing the uh, perception of pain. So I see four questions in the QA. How do I get those questions? <laughs> are you going to type them in? Because I can see the chat, but I don't see much else. Um, but uh, certainly uh, happy to start uh, jumping into some questions that will give us time to uh, really talk about the things that people are interested in talking about. I'll just relay these to you real quick. Uh, Fantastic. Wes. Thanks, Jordan. Um, so uh, Prashant Dawali says, uh, does the web RTC technology allow you to interact back and forth with the patient? So, um, so web RTC is a kind of an open source, um, non-proprietary uh, video technology. And yes, it can be used uh, for uh, two-way chat. I think that's what uh, the question is referring to. In fact, depending on the infrastructure you have on the back end, you can do multi-party chat, although it does start to hit limitations depending on your architecture design once you have maybe four or five. Um, now, there's ways around that. There's ways to architect that in a way that you can do more, but WebRTC certainly can be used for peer-to-peer, one-on-one uh, conversations. In fact, that's a lot of the reason that it was uh, designed for. And just to round that out, WebRTC is, certainly can do video, but it can also do audio, it can do screen sharing, it can do a lot of other things. It's really for real-time communications, which is what the RTC is for, but that's a fairly broad definition of types of communication. So and the that's follow an question, ask another one. And the follow-up question to that was, if the response is actually stayed um, for future documentation or, or for future visits as a reference. Could you say that again? So I, I think the question is, for those chat responses, do those stay and can those become part of the medical record? Mm. Is there permanence to those? Yes, uh, you certainly can. It won't automatically do that. Um, that's not within WebRTC's infrastructure because WebRTC is used by industries all over the place. Um, it, it would be up to the medical center to ha make sure that that process is tied to their and added to their electronic medical record system and to the to what extent that happens is going to be up to the medical center and the IT for example um, telephone calls is probably a, an easy way to uh, do an analogy you can in your electronic medical record you can 
state that you had a telephone call with the patient and you can, you know, the time, the day, and then you have to write a note about what that telephone call was about. I've been in systems where the, the recorded, the telephone call is actually recorded and the whole recording of that telephone call is available in their record system. May not necessarily be in the electronic medical record, but they do have a record um, tied to that, which can be linked to it. Um, so in a video chat, omni-channel type of uh, situation, you could either, it would again, it would be up to the individual uh, system how much of that they wanted integrated or available into their electronic medical record system. But, you know, it's, it's certainly possible. Again, it's going to depend on which electronic, electronic medical record system you have, whether that it has a place to put that. Um, but certainly the texts and the, you know, the, the typical string variables are really easy to copy and paste into those uh, sessions or have them added. Uh, the video and the sound, those are a little more uh, challenging. Uh, I've, I've still been wondering how to get my stethoscope sounds into electronic medical records reliably and stuff like that. That's been more of a hurdle. But. So the next questions are around video messaging. Um, the first one, uh, I'm, I'm going to take these in reverse order, um, uh, but uh, have you had any clients actually utilize the video messaging? And then the follow-up is, um, what application are you using for video messaging? Oh, I'm, okay, so I'm not supposed to advocate any particular vendor <laughs> um, for this, but if you, uh, you know, you can certainly Google video messaging um, and those types of services, or I guess you could just go to my website and look, because I think it's at the bottom of that that says powered by a company. Um, uh, do I have clients that use it? Yeah, that's, um, it's actually one of the things that I get to introduce to my patients. Um, again, because I do wound care, it's a very visual thing. It, it really helps me understand uh, the problems that they're having. And it works on their mobile devices. Um, and in, there's a couple little tricks uh, on the back end so that if they're not connected to the internet, they can still do the video. And then when they get connected to the, to the internet, it'll upload later so it caches on, on their device. Um, and then eliminates it once it transfers and things like that. Um, but it's been received pretty positively. Uh, so it's just kind of like, it's, I got rid of my home answering machine and the others, and I just say, look, that this is just now my personal answering machine, um, and use it as you would, instead of calling my phone, it just routes to this anyway, so. Okay, and then um, you, you kind of have answered this a little bit. I don't know if you want to elaborate on it further, but do you ever save patient engagement records into an EMR system? Do I save patient engagement records? So I, I would imagine that's refer referring to chat logs or to um, the video messages. Do you save those things into the EMR? Um. Yes, and the reason I'm pausing is because, <clears throat> so part of my life is with UC Davis, and another part of my life is I have an independent company in practice, um, so I, I work part-time in both. So the ones that happen at UC Davis are absolutely all logged into their system. The ones that happen in my company are logged into my system, but yes, everything is stored and kind of follows all the regulatory requirements for all of that. So in at UC Davis, they happen to use Epic. Epic has their uh, video visit version. Um, and there's certainly a way to, um, if for whatever reason there's an outside video that somebody happens to put in my other company, you can certainly transfer those and put those into secure storage uh, into UC Davis's system and stuff like that. Uh, and for my own uh, private practice, I have my own system <clears throat> set up to do all that with the audit trails and the logging and, and everything like that. But you know, that's kind of, it, it, it used to be really hard to capture te <clears throat> telephone calls. And that's probably one of the reasons that we didn't just stick them into the EMRs at the time. These days, capturing the stuff and storing it is so easy that it's pretty recommended that if you can do it, it makes good sense to do it. And certainly touch base with all your legal team and find out, you know, exactly how <clears throat> or, you know, if there are exceptions, what are they? I tend to just try to uh, fault on the side of storing too much 
just so if I can, I do it. And certainly within UC Davis, following all of their rules and regulations uh, and uh, practices and stuff. So definitely go back to your, um, you know, your healthcare system or if you have an, your individual clinic, just make sure you have policies and procedures in place and kind of those guidelines. And certainly for anything legal, touch base with your legal teams and stuff like that and follow best practices. But yes, you can absolutely store this stuff in a system, whether it's in the electronic medical record system or like in a PACS system, which sometimes is better uh, to store images or videos in. Um, it kind of is going to depend on your personal or your particular setup. And that's it for questions currently in the queue. Okay. Uh, we are at uh, 11.46. So certainly, I guess we're at the official Q&A time. Uh, so certainly, if there's <clears throat> any more questions, uh, feel free to send them in or clarifications. Uh, or if you have a point of view or a use case that you think you've seen video used, um, by all means, uh, share it and love to know about it. Otherwise, I'm going to start asking Jordan questions. So <clears throat> the other thing, I th in, until another question comes in, uh, just take a, you know, another few minutes of other ways to think about how to use uh, a video or some things I'm seeing trending for the future about video. Uh, I've seen systems starting to add cameras in their patient rooms. Certainly, probably all, a lot of us are familiar with the EICU, uh, where basically the ICU beds are monitored from a remote station. Um, and the success of that and what people have learned from that is starting to uh, foster the conversation to basically put similar systems, although not as complex, into the other patient rooms, which kind of basically turns every patient room in the hospital into a telehealth suite, if you know, for lack of a better uh, label. But once you've made that investment and you kind of have this t level of communication within every patient room, <clears throat> you start to realize, at least for a large hospital system, the benefit of being able to virtually make services available to patients' rooms all over your system. Uh, the easy one to talk about is uh, interpreter services. Uh, you know, you can when I was uh, in Utah, the interpreters had to drive everywhere uh, to provide their services, um, even to some of the very rural hospitals. Uh, so that was always a challenge. And uh, um, there's, I just, I'm sorry, I was just looking, I saw two other chat things come in. Um, the uh, having to be able to let your interpreters be virtually available and you know, kind of virtually bring them into a patient room as needed allows them to kind of essentially work in a call center environment and be virtually available everywhere. But you can do that for a lot of things, it turns out, in healthcare, at least in large hospital systems. For smaller clinics and things, there are still those types of benefits. Um, again, you know, an interpreter is a really great version of that, where you can bring an interpreter, if you have a contract with a company, to come in virtually into your clinic space or a family member into the clinic space when it's appropriate to do so or the patient's asking for that type of a thing. Um, another thing, you know, a way we've seen is introducing the patient to their home health nurse prior to discharge. So the home health nurse can be part of that discharge conversation so that everything is kind of on the same page. So you know, bringing this level of communication into places where it traditionally hasn't been thought of are kind of some of the new frontiers that I'm seeing uh, come through. Uh, I saw a, a question about uh, uh, Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, both, well, Medicare certainly has its rules and regulations for how to reimburse telemedicine um, and types of, you know, the, the clinical portions of it. Medicaid, there's 50 versions, 51 versions of how that's reimbursed in various levels and things like that. Although I would say most of those are really directed toward the clinical portion of, um, like, an an encounter <clears throat> and there's all sorts of requirements to meet that for you to get reimbursed for that. A number of the things that I've talked about are I would put in the bucket of uh, efficiencies in customer service which aren't really tied to a billable event but as other clinics and systems adopt these types of services 
it's a way to one make your office run a little more efficiently but also to provide an excellent customer service uh, in healthcare, which is probably not something that's usually used in the same sentence when we talk about healthcare, at least not in the past. So those aren't really billable events for, you know, like doing online registration or something like that. But I think certainly have some benefits from the customer side about, you know, choosing one clinic over another. And then there's another question here. What is your response for those doctors who are hesitant to use video in their practice? I would say that's fine. Um, and and I, I, I meet a lot of those and it, you know, that's okay. There's just personalities who are resistant to certain things. And that's why I say, well, you know what? That's, that would be like the last part of the, you know, a step to get their office online. And I usually just start talking about all the other things that the same, this investment in the same technology can do for their office. Even if they, as an individual practitioner, do not want to see patients on video, the rest of their office could still provide services to patients leveraging video. Um, in fact, I kind of recommend that for a lot of offices because I've seen a, a lot of situations where the practitioner or the provider invests a lot of effort into being available on video, but those workflows have left out all the other steps that their office goes through for them to see patients. So it's often it's kind of hard to go backwards because they might have invested in a, in a choice or a, a technology that really only did that provider to the patient experience. Whereas now on the market, there's <clears throat> you know, more choices. So when they do go look at, at an option to make an investment, and I talk about it just in, as an investment for their office's communication technology, not really telehealth. If I'm getting pushback or they're just kind of hesitant about that. Just talk about how their office, uh, you know, communicates with patients. Um, and then you get to look at some of these more, um, I guess, omni-channel. And by omni-channel, I mean text, audio, video, screen sharing, messaging, those kinds of things. Looking at those kinds of solutions, because the cost point is very low these days for individual small clinics. You know, you usually sign them up on a per patient or per seat basis per month. And very affordable but it allows the office to start adopting these types of virtual workflows or interacting with people online in different ways, such that when the provider gets a situation where the patient wants to talk to the provider for whatever reason, the rest of the office is pretty comfortable with this stuff already, and it's really easy to add them into those situations. I would say another way that uh, the hesitancy is, is many times the providers assume that these telemedicine patients aren't their usual patients. So I often recommend that the healthcare providers just think about their own patients and trying to uh, extend these types of services to their own patients. And it's really on a provider per, by provider decision is when you're in there with the patient and you want to do a follow-up, you know, just maybe ask yourself, okay, do I need to see this patient in person or could I just do this video remotely? Um, you know, for me, for wound care, it's kind of easy because patients change their dressings a lot. And I really want to see how that wound's progressing over time. I don't bill for that, although I think there's new codes now that I probably will be able to in the future. Um, but especially if your patients live far away or it's difficult for them uh, to get to you, most everybody's walking around with one of these little smartphones. Um, and again, for a very small investment, especially if the rest of your office is always already doing this and comfortable with it, it's a very small step at that point to get them to start seeing patients or interacting with patients in a virtual way. So I don't know if that answered your question well or not, but those are my thoughts. Have you seen anything else come through, Jordan? Um, so the Medicaid and Medicare, so I, I did create a, uh, or put in a link for our Center for Connected Health Policy. That's the telehealth resource center that's focused around um, the national and state um, policy information. So that's a great resource if you're looking, um, wanting to look up what the federal and state regulations are for telemedicine in your area. Excellent. And I think that's getting us closer to the top of the hour. <clears throat> so if there's any, I didn't know, I think there was some wrap up slides or something that we needed to make sure that we address. or be looking for any additional questions.
So no open questions. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for coming and um, certainly, you know, uh, Jordan and Doris and the uh, TRCs are welcome to share my information. If you have any, you know, questions that pop up later, happy to answer them over email or, the, you know, through the resource center process or, or any way that helps you uh, get the information you're looking for. So, but thank you uh, everyone for uh, allowing me the opportunity to speak and share some of my passion for this and some of the information I've come across. Looking forward to do it in the future. So thank you, Wes. Um, so this presentation has been part of the National Telehealth Resource Center's webinar series. Our next webinar is, um, well, our webinars occur every third Thursday of the month, and the next one is going to be on January 17th, uh, 2019. Um, and the times are listed on the slide there. The topic is going to be finding and vetting the perfect specialty service provider. Um, and the last thing that we'd like to ask real quick is, you know, we really do appreciate feedback to make these webinars more uh, useful to the services and things that you're doing in your area. Um, so please take a few minutes and complete the online survey to let us know how we're doing. Um, thank you very much. And that concludes our webinar for today.